project? What, what was it about it? I mean, you... um, I think it, I sort of um, it repelled me when I first read it because I thought, ah, oh, come on, another another war drama, another kind of boys with guns, big explosions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen it all before. And then I thought, actually, go back and look at it again, look at this character, and see if it's an opportunity to kind of reinvent that, which I thought it was. And I thought, you know, it's. It's a contemporary writer. It's some. It's a write written by somebody that isn't a novelist that was actually, you know, an operative. And I'd read mm. Bravo Two Zero years and years and years ago, and so I sort of knew that team. And I thought, actually, <coughs> this man's been on the inside of this. So whether or not he's written a good book, I wasn't really interested in. I thought, you know, he's got the the, uh, the bones of a good character. So it was actually the character that I was attracted to. And I think mm. that the writers. The subsequent writers of the series were also attracted to the characters more than the single storyline. Um, <coughs> so I think, and the thing about being attracted to that character was, you know, the, a very simple premise of a man that's in that's uh, that makes a decision in a moment of uh, extremis. Um, mm. That decision has such has a knock-on effect on his whole life. He goes in search of atonement still believing that he made the right decision despite the fact that three of his friends died uh, and I think that living with that sense of hang on I did the right thing I made the right decision I did the right thing but why was the outcome so wrong and I think that that sort of simple premise takes the character through six episodes and probably further I think oh, really yeah think there's I think there's a yeah I think there's a potential to have because that that's a fundamental question about an individual in a state of you know, in a place of war, you know, can the individual Absolutely. mind, conscience, compassion work in that environment? When you're trained to be a killing machine, mm -hmm. can you then function as a human being, a man with feelings and a family and a child and a wife? And you know, how do you f suppress that and just go out and kill without thought? And do, I mean, I mean, and can a man make those decisions under those conditions, um, or is it? What did you kill away from? Think? I, I kind of came away thinking that. It's it's sort of impossible as an, on an individual level. I think it's possible on a on a on mass. Uh, you know, when you think of an army that that are conditioned not to think as individuals, I think mm. it's possible. But this person, uh, you know, at ground level, these the people are individuals. That and therefore, I think that the notion of human being being part of a military force is actually a paradox that will never be solved. Um, and do you, did you think, did you feel you had to live up to this character of, I mean it's imbued with Chris Ryan isn't it? I yeah. Mean, did you, did it, was that a part of the challenge of it? Yeah, yeah and actually I kind of wanted him to be better than I was, I wanted him to be the kind of bloke that I'd like to be, mm. even with all the flaws and I kind of admire the flaws in him and I admire the tenacity for standing up and saying no I made a mistake. Um, I'm going to take the consequences, but I'm going to I'm going to search out the reasons why why it was a mistake. I'm going to question this. I'm going to I'm, and, and I can't rest until I do. And I kind of admired that in the character mm. and and the fact. Quite a bit of anger, isn't there? Driving it. Yeah, I think so. I, th I think it's anger. It's also it's absolutely it's complete injustice as well. I think when because mm. he's so strongly. I mean, in a way, he's quite um, he's quite alpha male in that way. He's quite black and white that. You know, I did the right thing. The wrong outcome happened. You know, that should not have happened. Why did that happen? I don't, mm. I don't think that he was able to assimilate him. He got the hostage out. Yeah, he, he got he got the result, but mm. he lost his he lost his family. He yeah. lost his daughter. He lost his wife. They, I thought the family's a bit tough on him, aren't they? Really? Isn't the wife? <coughs> there was one. I mean, there was I, one line actually. That, that, you know, there's one line I'd never heard. Okay, like, off we go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I saw the marriage kind of breaking down, and then there's a line. Later on, when, when he goes AWOL and she says, you know, we're all better off without him. And I was like, God, I've never read that. I'm really shocked. And, and, and actually in the screening, being quite upset for, for John because he'd, he'd been abandoned like that. But I, I think uh, after years and years and years of, of that kind of lifestyle, that life, uh, you know, Maybe to be an army wife board. and a, raising a child, I think it must be absolutely exhausting. Mm. And that knock on the door, you know, always. That must be awful. And yeah. did you, I mean, who did you meet and talk to to sort of develop the character and stuff? Um, I, I didn't actually get access to Chris because he came on as a developer with, with the writers. Um, I had three 
SAS guys that were there the whole time we were shooting. Wow. And that they were South, South African SAS and uh, another guy who was in They better all British. work for that lot. <laughs> <laughs> are they, uh, They're all different. Are they? But, uh, in a, in a similar way to, to the similar way to um, to uh, surgeons that, that do the same operation but they all take different routes in. Mm. The same with the SAS. They've all got that was what was brilliant about it because you could you could say okay here's the book this is what you do by the book but in reality this is what happens and and having those people so that you know we, we're setting up a situation where we sort of you know, the hostage taken in the beginning of episode one and they'd say well this is what the book says you do but however look at the shape of this door look at this corridor you, there's no way you can do that so we're going to bend it around oh, right, this, this location so I mean it was so fantastic. that was sort of reconstructing the yeah plot, totally. as it were, the mechanics step, of the step plot. by step. And they wow. were there. They were there, kind of saying, "No, you can't do that. You can't move across the room like that. You, you, you know, there's a door here. You can't do that. You can't. The three men won't do that. And, and this is what you would do." So, did that make it more difficult to actually do it, though? Uh, it m there was always a kind of a negotiation with what was going to look good on camera and what was absolutely realistic. And so, we always found a, a happy medium. But luckily, Daniel Percival, who was the writer director, he wanted it as real. He wanted it real. He wanted the, you know people that do this for a living to sit down and watch this and go yes that's how it's done gosh that's a high standard it, because most of the audience yeah. won't know one way or the other no, will they? no and, and actually uh we had two different directors obviously we got a director coming on board at the end and uh daniel was very efficient with the amount of rounds that were pulled off um you know when yeah. you double tap somebody that's it you don't you don't you know, fire at will. Whereas the second director, it, it, it was—it's much more kind of. It feels much more American in its style. But I mean, they both stand up yes, against yeah. each other. But it was a noticeable difference. I suppose it's what is it less professional to fire um, few rounds of is it all? It's yeah. The more efficient you are, the, you the less rounds you use. Oh, um, you. But then, th you know, the second director was in it was in a totally different environment. It wasn't a military operation. It was a solo operation. Yeah, I see. Right. So. Yeah, there was a bit more license to. But you must have picked up and learned so much about this sort of stuff. <laughs> I did. I mean, I kind of feel like I've scratched the surface there. That's why I want to go back and do more because, um, yeah, it, it did get to the point when you first start and you first pick up the weapon and you first get all the gear on and you think, I feel like Richard Armitage inside a ridiculous costume. Hole. But then, sort of a few weeks into the shoot, I suddenly started going, oh, where's my gun? I can't, well, I can't work without, I couldn't work without my weapon, I needed it there, uh, and then once I had it, I was like, okay, and they'd come and take it you off, off you between takes, and I'd be like, actually, no, can I just kind of hang on to it? It just felt like an extension of my arm, really, so, mm. um, yeah, it didn't take long to, to uh, I suppose because I was, I was pretty much working every day, uh, so I was living with the character, and when you're away from home, um, and working late like that, because we were working long days, you kind of don't ever leave the character, so I was starting to dream as the character at really? night, God, which was really annoying. Night. I was like, "God, get out of my head, please!" There was a, there was a, there was a it kind of, there was an episode which is set in a prison, which is episodes two, three, and four, right. uh, and I was having all these prison escape dreams because we, there's a whole sequence where they they break out through this hole in the wall and they go down through these tunnels, and night wow. after night I was sort of dreaming how they escape. <laughs> it was just endless. <laughs> So I was doing it in the day and then get home at night and I still couldn't get out. <laughs> yeah. And have you ever played anything like similar to this before? I mean, it's looks a little bit different. I mean, there's action, of course, but this is a real. Yeah, I I think I've touched on it occasionally, but never on this never on this scale. Mm. Uh, and uh, yes, it's interesting because in a way, John's feels like the 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 alter ego of Lucas North. It, you know, Lucas is the you know the controlled. MI5, yes. blah blah blah, and in a way, John is like the weapon. He's the one that's out there mm, you know, mm. in, in the field, and uh, I quite liked the fact that I was going to play the other side of, of this world, of this this is intelligence this world. Hard enough, Lucas. Then is it going to make it easier? It's certainly. It, it's interesting coming back they to are this quite side. Close characters. Are they going to affect each other as they um, carry on in respected series? It's interesting because I think if <laughs> you, you know, they'll meld into one. Or well, I. You know, I worried about that because they are, you know, they are quite close in uh, subject matter. But then when, the idea of putting Lucas and John in the same room together, sitting them down, and then I suddenly thought that these guys are nothing like each other. They, no. they, they wouldn't. The Harry Hill moment. Isn't it? Yeah, I mean, John would think Lucas was an absolute wanker, and Lucas would be like, 
go away and shoot your guns and <laughs> let me kind of be the thinking yeah. man. And uh, yeah. so actually, yeah, the idea of them coming together and, uh, and John would take Lucas down in a fight like that. Really? Yeah. Because he knows so which all one is the closest to Richard though? I mean, that's inevitable. Uh, that's a good one. Uh, probably Lucas, actually. Probably. Well, that's because I've probably lived with him for a bit longer, so yeah. he feels closer. But John feels like a, a slightly uncontrollable child at the moment that I'm trying to rein in and uh, still having fun with him a bit. And so where would where would it go if there was another series? I mean, is there another book? Go anywhere. Or Really? So you, yeah. he could, what, he, does he end up with a sort of unit at the end, or is he just still on his own? Is he no, at the end of the series, he's driving off into the into Iran. He's crossing the border really? into he's Iran. Yeah, he's gone into <laughs> <laughs> and and the um, wow, that's, and that's a great Toby Stevens is going, get him, hunt him down. Really? <laughs> yeah, with the most amazing crane shot, and you literally you've got this. You, the, the camera starts in the back of the car, and the Land Rover drives to the landscape, and then it gradually pulls up into a helicopter shot and the landscape just gets wider and wider and the car just disappears and you think okay that's why we went to South Africa because it's just massive view. it's a massive really? shot yeah gosh well that sounds encouraging yeah. that's enough I've, I've heard you know series based on this and that yeah <laughs> no I'd love to go and do more and you really could take you could go anywhere you and so you're happy to keep playing these two characters I'm talking about these series together as it were but uh, it doesn't trouble you as an actor to play two reasonably close characters um, I it's my job to try and make them different. Yeah, it's my pleasure as an actor to be employed. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> How's that for an answer? It's good. It's it, it, well, seriously, in a year yeah. that I think has been disastrous for drama, last year I think you know I'm I'd be surprised if Why any of the channels have got anything to to pr to, mm. to show this year, next year because because all the years? well all the drama budgets got cut. You know, mm. Channel Four didn't spend anything. You know, BBC had to. You know, seriously, rein it in. I don't think it's always a bad thing because I think it forces writing into a into a concentrated nugget of of you know interesting stuff. As, as the, although it's small, it's a small amount of drama. But um, you know, Sky with a guy spending money on stuff and being ambitious, and I think it's you know it's commendable, really. Yeah. And do you think things have picked up from where you're sitting? You know, in terms yeah, of yeah. I think there's a fresh sort of is almost like a slight sigh of relief and and, and, and it, I think it has to go through that though I think there has to be a slight kind of pause where people go hang on a minute hang on a minute and then right now we know what we're doing I think when mm. when you know because of I think because of ITV and, and you know that they got very close to, to going under and yeah uh, I think it, but everyone was running scared from contemporary drama anyway yeah to me I mean but Channel 4 as well, Channel 4, for Channel me... Channel 4, I don't know what's going on. But they were making some great stuff, mm. and I think it, it, everyone gets scared, and they think, shit, that, you know, it's it's the end. And then I think when once you've had that moment where you think, OK, if we are going to make something, we've got to make something really good, rather than going, well, yeah, we've got loads of money to spend, let's just make loads of rubbish. Mm. I think it, it, you know, it has well, a I just read effect. a bit of broadcast. Ben Stevenson says he's got yeah. $200 million to spend next year. Yeah. I thought it was blind. Yeah. And that, that's 200 out. Well, yeah, that's, that's um, probably more than Jonathan Ross's fee, isn't it? No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, no, it's great. And yeah, they've got, the, you know, I think that, that you know, Sky have basically pushed everyone else to, to sort of think, hang on a minute, God, we've got to really work hard. And I, I really like the fact that, you know, because I work for both, you know, I work for BBC, I work for Sky now, and I like the fact that, that it's it's competition, but it's competition that breeds, you know, um, good television making. You know? Yeah, absolutely. So you didn't think, and this is great respect to Sky, yeah. that I'm going to do a drama and potentially I might get a, f a fraction of the audience that I would otherwise get on, you know, your former terrestrial channel. Yeah, I suppose I no, I didn't. I didn't think about audience at all. I um, no, I just thought about. Uh, whether I wanted to do it or not, whether it was a piece I wanted to do, and, and uh, I kind of always feel like that. I, it's not really about, you know, I'd be happy to, and have done, you know, theatre where you play to an audience of twenty. It's, it's still worth playing if it's worth playing, and and uh, it's a different kind of audience. I think the Sky's audience are, are much more selective. Um, you don't just stick the TV on and it just happens to come onto the screen. No. I think you have to choose a lot more, and you have to. You know, you, there's so much to choose from. You have to really uh, filter it. 
I know this now because I've got Sky. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, wow, God, look, all this to watch. What, what do I watch? But you do, you get really specific, and mm. I think people, in general, are watching TV in a completely different way. Yeah, um, even this year on Spooks, when I see episode one and I see what the ambition is for episode one, it, it's like a feature film. Mm. You know, it's, it's a big cargo ship and explosions and blah 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 out of Tangiers and. Um, you know, people have got massive televisions now. I think they sort of switch the lights out and watch television like sure. like cinema. Yeah, um, and that's why it was interesting at the screen is seeing this hold up on a big screen and, and all the commercial breaks, which were sort of moments where the screen went black, actually became sort of like pauses in music. And I th and I said, it wasn't until the end that I thought, ah, they were the commercial breaks. Thank <laughs> God there were no commercials. Can you imagine having to sit through kind of Jacob's Cream Crackers in the middle of strike back but they, there were moments where you kind of gathered your breath and then carried yeah. on with the next bit and I thought god that's a really it's a really um, interesting. interesting you know device I'll yeah. use that when I'm the filmmaker <laughs> <laughs> do you like to be one uh, yeah I think so either a filmmaker or a producer I can't do this for the rest of my life can I come on really I don't know <laughs> oh, come on you're doing pretty well out of eight. I mean yeah. why, why, why would you not want to what well, getting lead roles in big yeah, dramas but once no? you get comfortable you've got to move on haven't you you've got to shake it up I'm not, I'm not comfortable yet. I, I haven't explored everything that I want to do, but, uh, yeah. What about, um, I mean, America, I thought, you know, there's been a drift, hasn't there, of lots of talent towards Yeah, America. they have. TV That's probably America. why I'm working, because all, all the good actors <laughs> have gone to America. Oh, well, that <laughs> indefinitely. <laughs> It's true. Richard has all yeah. his success yeah. too. To the fact that everyone's buggered <laughs> off to America. Great. Right. And who else can we get rid of? What, what job doesn't Rupert <laughs> Henry Jones want to do now? I'll have it. I'll do it. See <laughs> what we can do. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's so great. So have any offers been coming in from there, from those quarters? Um, not, no, 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 no. No film? No, no, no. film offers? No? No, um, I, I think I, I think I send out messages, but I'm always, in, always employed, uh, which is a good thing. But mm. yeah, maybe the end of this year, I think uh, I might go have a sniff around, and then come back and start work again at home. I mean, this this particular role would be, you know, it's a great sort of advertisement for a type of film that yeah. Americans do like, don't they? Yeah, action true. hero, as it were. I mean. In, in whichever hue, I mean, is that... I, I, yeah, you're right, but I feel like it's weird because, you know, people say, well, you know, you could go do a big American series, you know, like Strike Back, and it's like, well, I'm kind of doing it already, but it's just not, um, you know, it, this will probably sell to America, it will probably transfer to America, but it's like I'm kind of playing the role that I want. I don't, I would be surprised if I'd get that kind of chance in America. I think I might have to go back and do six lines in a movie. I'd happily do that, I'm not, I'm not proud, but uh, I've got very used to creating a whole character yeah, uh, yeah. And, you know, from beginning to end, and sometimes when you have to step in and do six lines, it's not that satisfying. But I'd sort no, of interestingly, they've become the, sort of the film industry in a way, haven't they? Those yeah. you know, big, big series with you know, big story arcs and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, it's interesting the amount of big names that are go moving now into American television because you can kind of carve out a character, you know, look at something like Damages and... And do you think you've got more, as an actor, you've got more influence over the way the character develops in these series than you do in the film? Um, the, more, the more done and dusted in the film? I don't, to be honest, because I haven't played a lead character in a film, I don't know. I'm, I'm su uh, suspecting that there's probably, there's more time to develop your character, whereas the mm. film, you know, you've got, I suppose, yeah, because I'm planning a well, I, I'm, I'm hoping up to. I've got a script in development, which isn't mine, but it's it's about it's about Richard the Third, and it keeps kind of getting moved around into you know, can we do this in two and a half hours? Should we make a film? Mm -hmm. There's too much to tell. Let's do 20 episodes, yeah. and then you think, ah, oh, yeah, and then we can tell all of the story, and we can let the character go from 16 to. You know. So, would you play Richard? Maybe I might end up being too old by the time it goes into production. I might have to play Warwick, but <laughs> I might I might not be able to do any of it. I might have to uh, just. Yeah. Stand, stand back and. and is, uh, as a film or as. Well, again, we don't know. You it, don't know. It's too much to fit into a film. You'd have to mm -hmm. make three films, and I don't know whether there's enough interest to make three films out of that, but uh, we think I'm it fascinated might. Already. Yeah, it might. I think it might go into a sort of uh, 20 episode, sort of long running 
Wars of the Roses kind of thing. Really? Well, Tudors did very well. Yeah. Today. And this is the prequel to the Tudors, so, yeah, so you it's just trying to get someone interested, you know, because I, I know a lot of people that are interested, but there's no one that will step on the gas and quite. Nearly there. Nearly there. Very interesting. Now, tell me about this sort of legion of fans you've got. I mean, you've got this... <laughs> You're not hearing them. They're outside now. Oh look, there's another pair of pants hitting the window. <laughs> I mean, is this is it all a part of form? Do they exist? This, uh, I think this so. Art, yeah. Are they the artistic army? Yeah. It's a sort have of. Have you come into contact? Have you come into contact with these people? Um, yeah, they they kind of turn up at uh, things. I think I'd probably have, if I'd done a bit more theatre, then I probably would have a bit more contact. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they they all kind of show up occasionally, write nice letters. Do they're they? Very supportive. Yeah. Oh, they, yeah. Yeah. Men, women. Mainly, mainly women. Mainly middle-aged, quite well-educated Radio Four listeners, I'd say. <laughs> but they all kind of came from north and south, and then gradually I've picked up a uh, different sort of audience with all the different types of. I mean, I've done quite a few genres now. I've kind of done a bit of done, children's yeah. television. You know, Robin Hood was aimed at young people, mm -hmm. and then. You know, this oh, is very good character. Very good character. Thanks. This is hopefully going to go for a slightly different this is slightly audience. Yeah, no. I, I think they'll what, disapprove of this one. Well, there's, well, there's a bit of sort of. Well, yeah. I've only seen episode one, but there, how does the love interest develop in this? Does it? it, it, it yeah, it's. Uh, He's not a romantic hero, though, is he? Not in the same way as some of the other characters that I've played. I mm. think it's, it, it's less focused on that. It's more focused on, you know, the the uh, the boys. The boys kind of yeah, I see. together. And as an actor, where do, which do you like playing the best? Because that seems like quite a divide in what you do. I mean, um, you do the romantic hero, and you also do this. You know what? When you're when you're playing that kind of character, you long to get on a motorbike or grab a gun and have a run around and just punch somebody. And then when you're doing the punching, you long to sort of sit in a cravat in a bumpy carriage on a road with a horse. You know, you, <laughs> you always kind of want one or the other. Oh, right. Yeah, I suppose I try and bring a little bit of this cerebral kind of uh, yeah. There's a sort of thinking, there's a thinking, feel, touchy feely thing about romantic hero that I've tried to push in through John, and then likewise in the romantic hero with oh, Guy okay. Gisman trying to trying to give him a slightly steely edge, and mm -hmm. I like mixing it up so that yeah. And so what next? I suppose you'll more of this. Then more of this. Maybe, maybe more. Um, maybe a play next year. A oh. comedy. <laughs> a comedy. <laughs> Please, a comedy. Please. Is that what you're, are you yeah. appealing for a comedy? Yeah, I think it's time to lighten up. I'm so. I think some reviewer said sour-faced Richard Armitage, and I suddenly thought, you know what? You're right. You're right. I am pretty, pretty sour-faced <laughs> the whole time. So, <laughs> so um, yeah, maybe uh, hoping to do a, an, a, a, the Rover, uh, Afro Ben's play. Yeah. Um, Half of, probably halfway through next year, it'll be a little romp in the woods kind of show. Oh, very good. That'd be nice. And then um, Spooks goes on Spooks and goes on, doesn't series. it? I mean, do you know do you, do you know how the series ends? Are we on another cliffhanger here? I don't know. I said to them, take it where you will. If it's a if it's the deep fat fryer for me, then so be it. <laughs> I do like the churn rate. It's just about right in Spooks. I think it I've is. often thought. Yeah. Well, Harry is still around, but you know. Yeah, I think the show would die without Harry. Mm. If they decided to kill Harry, they'd finally have to make Spooks the movie, which I, every time I see the executives, Jane and Simon, I keep saying, okay, when are you going to make the movie? Because, you know, like they did with X Files. Yes, yeah. This Spooks would make such a good movie. It would actually, yeah. Mm. But then, as we were saying earlier, sometimes it's better than a film, though, isn't it? Because, you know. Yeah. Although the series where they had the big overarching story didn't actually work as well, yeah. I didn't think. Not, with your, not no. about your story of the week, but I think if they found the uh, the definitive spook storyline, then they could, mm. but again, there isn't one. Maybe something about the Olympics, I don't know. Yeah. Marvellous. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. You're very welcome. Cool. There you go. Yeah, if you wouldn't mind. Well, if I only managed to get 25 minutes and 32 seconds, actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> running ahead of time as well. And we're running ahead of time now. Yeah. Is somebody calling me? Well, no, I'm going to film them now, oh, which is, is I just thought. Um, well, I'm just trying to.